Okay. Hi, everybody. Um, I, uh, it's for you, those of you who do not know me yet, um, I'm uh, Xin Luo. I'm a associate professor of immunology at the Department of Biomedical Sciences and Pathobiology at the VET School. Um, before I introduce our speaker today, I would like to remind everybody that um, uh, there is a Q&A uh, place that you can type in your questions and I will be reading uh, the, uh, the chat box, uh, the Q&A box uh, to um, relay the question to our speaker. Okay, so it is with great pleasure that I introduce to you Dr. Xun Rong Luo, a world leading physician scientist and organ transplant expert who is our speaker today. Dr. Luo earned her MD and PhD degrees from Duke University her research training includes postdoc training with Nobel laureate Ralph Stenman. Dr. Luo was a principal investigator at Northwestern University for 13 years, starting as assistant professor, then up the ranks all the way to Margaret Gray Morton Indoor Professor of Medicine. In 2018, she moved back to Duke University School of Medicine as the director of translational research, Duke. Duke Transplant Center. At Duke, she is also the Director of Physician Scientist Training Program and the Chair of the Research Development Council. Dr. Luo is a Fellow of the American Asso uh, uh, Society of Transplantation and an elective member of the American Society for Clinical Investigations. She has won many awards, including American Society of Transplantation Basic Science Investigator Award and Northwestern University Research Mentoring Award. She is an editor of the journal Transplantation and has served on numerous NIH review panels. Actually, I met her at one of the NIH study sections a few years ago. She has held many grants from NIH and foundations and currently have two active R01s and a U01. Today, the title of Dr. Luo's talk is Transplantation Tolerance Can Be Achieved. Now what? Dr. Luo, the floor is yours. Thank you, Shin. Thank you very much for this uh, a nice introduction. Uh, this is like a year delay from uh, the initial invitation. I wish I could be there in person, but, uh, but, but Zoom is, is as good as it gets for the time being. So uh, my talk today will be talking about transplantation tolerance. I will separate my uh, talk into two uh, sections. The first part, I will be talking about uh, a, a strategy of transplantation tolerance that's pioneered by my lab and uh, how we worked our way through small animals to large animals, hopefully eventually to humans. And the second part of my talk uh, is gonna be focused on uh, one of the uh, threats that we see uh, for maintaining stable tolerance that's uh, clinically relevant. So uh, introducing to this audience of uh, organ transplantation. Now, end organ damages, as you know, can mostly be cured by transplantations of many different organs, uh, initially kidney, liver, and pancreas. Uh, and now with the advancement of technology, we also have the ability to transplant small bowels and in the chest ca cavity, heart and lungs. And more recently, the vascular composite tissue transplants such as limb transplant, or what I didn't list here is face transplant, and also most recently uterus transplant for, uh, for encouraging pregnancies. So not surprisingly, in the past uh, 10, 15 years, we've seen a consecutive increase of yearly uh, transplant numbers in the US. And this is slightly old data from 2018, but as of 2021, we're in the 10th consecutive record-breaking years in terms of the number of transplants that we perform each year, uh, now pushing to close to 40,000 per year. But what's the problem? The problem is that these organs are from a different human being, uh, mostly deceased donor, but some in some cases like kidney, also living donor, but the, these are from a different um, human being. So for this reason, the recipient of that organ would have to take lifelong immunosuppression. And so what I'm showing you here is not an exaggeration 
uh, of the number of pills that, that these patients would need to take on a daily basis. So it's not just only anti-rejection medications, but a slew of medications that are used to control the side effects of the immunosuppression. So some of these side effects include metabolic uh, effects, things like diabetes, which is very commonly seen in post-transplant patients who were not diabetic before transplant, but because of the immunosuppression that they, uh, they, they would have to take, uh, become diabetic. Hyperlipidemia, neurotoxicity, GI side effects, and decreased fertility. And these are just metabolic side effects, but more importantly, because the immune system is suppressed, these patients tend to be more susceptible to uh, opportunistic infections, such as viral, fungal, and bacterial infections, which normally uh, may or may not cause disease in an immune competent host, but in an immune suppressed host, these become uh, much more uh, morbid. And more uh, importantly, secondary malignancies, cancers post-transplant is also uh, a, a commonly seen um, uh, side effects of these immunosuppressions, things like post-transplant lymphoproliferative disease, so a form of lymphoma. Skin cancers is also really common in post-transplant recipients and less commonly tumor of solid organs. Therefore, for this reason, the holy grail for transplantation had always been to induce transplantation tolerance. And that is a state of accepting the transplanted organ, but without the need for any immunosuppression. So clinically, um, various experimental protocols have tried to induce what's called hematopoietic chimerism. So what I'm showing you here uh, uh, is a picture of a quintessential example of what, what hematopoietic chimerism is. This is actually from a liver transplant recipient who developed spontaneous hematopoietic chimerism, probably because of the vast large number of stem cells that can be transferred from a, a liver allograft. And what I'm showing you here is a sex mismatched donor recipient pair uh, in, in which you can see the green uh, XX cells uh, are co-circulating with the XY cells in the periphery. Uh, therefore, without uh, clearly without attacking each other or killing each other, and they are able to coexist in the circulation peacefully. So that's the idea of chimerism. And once chimerism can be established, then the, the, the donor of the bone marrow clearly wouldn't recognize the same uh, donor's organ as foreign, therefore won't be able to reject it. So this is a, a, an, an example of spontaneous hematopoietic chimerism, like I said before, but there are actually multiple experimental protocols that have been developed in the past uh, two decades to kind of induce such a hematopoietic state and transplanting the recipient with the donor's bone marrow, hoping that eventually uh, chimerism can be established so that this, the, uh, an organ from that same donor can be transplanted into the recipient without the need of immunosuppression. But what's the problem of this type of approach? It clearly requires recipient bone marrow conditioning, so chemotherapy and bone marrow ablation in order to create space for the, for the donor's uh, bone marrow to engraft. But more importantly, there's a lifelong uh, risk for graft-versus-host disease, which sometimes can be lethal. Uh, and this remains a formidable uh, obstacle to this type of approach. So are there alternative approach uh, that can be used? So it turns out that the body actually uh, tolerizes uh, things hundreds of thousands of times, if not, if not millions of times a day by non-clearing, self-renewing apoptotic cells in a non-inflammatory way. So barring this idea of self-tolerance, which I'm showing you here, self-apoptotic cells are cleared uh, millions of times a day and they elaborate these signals of find me and eat me eventually are uh, phagocytosed by uh, professional phagocytes. And these phagocytes then elaborate the tolerate me signal, which can include a number of uh, uh, immunodegenerative uh, uh, 
uh, modulatory cytokines such as IL-10, TGF, beta. And this idea we thought, well, perhaps we could borrow it to induce uh, allo antigen tolerance. Can we do that? So we know we can induce apoptosis of donor cells quite effectively. And we do so in our lab by using a chemical cross-linker called ethylene carbodiamide. And this is a chemical cross-linking agent that has been used for other purposes of cross-linking antigen to cell surface. But we know that one of the effects uh, that it has is to cause, effectively cause apoptosis of the cells that, that it treats. So we initially tested our idea in a mouse model of uh, transplantation. So from this point onward, the mouse studies that I'm describing are, use, uh, are using uh, a full MHC mismatched transplantation model. We use bulb C, which is H2D as donors, and we use the C57 black, which is H2B as our recipients. So uh, all the mouse studies I've, I'm, I'm, I will be describing will be in this uh, mouse models. So we initially took donor uh, bulb C spleen and obtained uh, splenocytes, so donor cells by getting rid of the red cells, uh, creating the single cell suspension. And then we treated these cells with this ethylene carbodiamide to cause apoptosis of the donor cells. And now we have ECDI treated donor splenocytes. And then we introduced by tail vein injection into the recipient, in this case, B6 mice, and simply ask the question, will that treatment alone pr uh, provide protection to the subsequent transplanted uh, graft from that same donor B6, uh, sorry, bulb C. So this is a timeline of uh, our transplantation uh, protocol. And we always call the date of transplantation day zero. So that's, uh, that's sort of the, um, the, the convention that, we, that you'll see in most of my uh, subsequent data. And in this case, we also give the ECDI treated donor splenocytes seven days prior to transplantation and one day after transplantation. And what are the results? So what I'm showing you here uh, is again, a pretty typical graph survival curve that I'll explain a little bit uh, for the first time. So day zero is the day of transplantation. And we always uh, look at the percentage of graphs that, uh, that are still surviving at any given point, the time point post-transplantation. So on day zero, we start at 100%. And then what you can see here is that in, in a normal situation, in a control situation, if you don't do anything in this bulb C to B6 transplant scenario, all grafts uh, are pretty much rejected by day 20. They start to be rejected by maybe about day 15, day 12, and by day 20, all grafts are rejected. And that's our control scenario in this great uh, uh, square line. However, if we treat the recipient with two doses of this ECDI treated donor cells, donor splenocytes, we, you can see that if we essentially have close to 100% protection uh, for over 100 days. Now, mind you, these are recipients that are not on any immunosuppression uh, and the only thing that they received were these two doses of ECDI treated donor splenocytes on day minus seven, day plus one. And this treatment with ECDI is clearly critical because it, if we don't treat the donor cells, bulb C cells with ECDI, we actually, in fact, sensitize the recipients and cause accelerated graft rejection. And that's a typical scenario for donor sensitization. We also know this treatment is, uh, is uh, exquisitely donor specific because if we treat um, the recipient with a third party cell, in this case, SJL, which is a different uh, mismatched strain, um, the treated recipients then do not uh, have a, a way of protecting their bulb C uh, allograft in the future. So, so what you see here is uh, donor specificity as shown in this uh, diamond uh, shape line. So there is no protection whatsoever of the uh, bulb C graft if you treat it with a third party ECDISP.
So this approach appears to be quite effective. Does ECDI treatment really cause apoptosis? And wh what I'm showing you here is that indeed it does as, as we ex expected uh, because ECDI treated uh, splenocytes have a significantly higher percentage of apopto uh, apoptotic cells. And as you leave them in the culture for longer and longer periods of time, more and more percentages become uh, apop uh, apoptotic. And if we, sh uh, what I'm showing you here is an in vitro uh, phagocytic um, I don't know how to play the movie here. Um, okay, well, maybe you just have to trust me. What I'm showing you here, it, it, it's a movie that shows these macrophages that are, that are co-cultured with these red dye labeled ECDI splenocytes. These macrophages swim around and just mop up these uh, ECDI uh, uh, treated uh, apoptotic cells quite effectively. So, so in vitro, we definitely can see that they're apoptotic and they're effectively phagocytosed by professional phagocytes. Now we know that phagocytes um, such as macrophages and dendritic cells use a set of receptors that are called TAN receptors to represent tyro-3-XL MRTK. And the, this set of receptors uh, can engage the phosphatidylserine on apoptotic cells to induce uh, a form of non-inflammatory phagocytosis. So we first became interested to know whether or not uh, this set of receptors are involved in tolerance that's induced by ECDI treated donor cells. So what I'm showing you here is that if we have recipients that are deficient in this particular uh, receptor MER, then we essentially completely lost the protection by ECDI SP, suggesting that this receptor is intimately in implicated in mediating the effect of, uh, of the uh, infused apoptotic donor cells. But I guess what's more interesting is that this loss of protection seems to be entirely reversed if we just um, neutralize interferon, uh, uh, block the interferon alpha and interferon alpha receptor interaction, suggesting that, that this receptor, MER, is mediating uh, uh, phagocytosis of ECDISP uh, by controlling interferon alpha production. And I'll come back to that point a little bit later. So then we spent uh, the re next couple of years really trying to understand what are the mechanisms of this ECDISP being phagocytosed in a non-inflammatory way that it truly uh, led to the eventual tolerance induction. And so it turns out uh, that this tolerance is mediated through a number of parallel regulatory mechanisms, which I will go into a little bit detail here, but without going into uh, a, a lot of the experimental um, uh, details. So the first population uh, of cells that seems to be implicated in ECDI uh, splenocytes induced tolerance are these cells called myeloid derived suppressor cells. So what I'm showing you here is a gating strategy of how we identify these cells. And so what you can see here is that these are CD11 B cells uh, that are segregated into two populations of the GR1 high myeloid derived uh, suppressor cells and the Ly6C high myeloid derived suppressor cells. And that's our gating strategy. And what you can see here is by the two doses of the allogeneic splenocytes injection, we can see that it actually uh, cause the increase of both populations of the MDSCs. So are they important? We can use a neutralizing antibody, anti-GR1, to pretty effectively deplete these two populations of MDSCs. And when we do so, we, again, pretty much lost the efficacy of the ECDI-SP um, uh, uh, effect on tolerance induction. So this suggests that these two cell populations are probably uh, in, uh, also implicated in mediating the effect of uh, tolerance induction by ECDISP. We then went on to show that 
the MDSCs actually induce regulatory T cell uh, production. So what I'm showing you here is one of the results uh, that, that shows that with ECDISP treatment, you, uh, you would see a significant uh, upregulation of regulatory T cells in the spleen, in the draining lymph nodes, as well as in the graft uh, of our transplant recipients. And if you deplete the, these regulatory T cells, you would lose the efficacy of the protection. So what I'm showing you here is a slightly different graph survival curve than the ones that I've shown you before. This is in an islet cell transplantation uh, model. Therefore, we could use blood glucose to, um, uh, to tell us whether or not the transplanted graft had been rejected or not. So what you see here is that if you don't deplete the regulatory T cells, the, these islet grafts uh, function for, uh, we only followed here to 60 days, but uh, with, with clear uh, stable function. But if you deplete the regulatory T cells with this antibody anti-CD25, you then begin to see that these islet grafts uh, are rejected leading to uh, recurrent hyperglycemia in these recipients. So we again know that from this set of experiments, regulatory T cells are also implicated in mediating the effect of um, ECDI splenocytes. Now, when you think about rejection, you uh, would naturally think about the adaptive T cell responses, uh, anti-donor specific T cells. And so our next set of questions, what happened to these uh, donor specific T cells? Are they controlled? How are they controlled by, uh, by uh, the treatment of donor ECDI uh, SP? So, we, so it turns out that these donor specific T cells, depending on their subsets, they are controlled by different mechanisms. So the first mechanism is deletion. So what I'm showing you here and the details, again, are not so important. This is a specific type of donor-specific uh, T cells that we could adoptively transfer into the recipients so that we can trace the, its behavior. So what you can see here uh, is that after the treatment with ECDI SP of the donor origin, you initially see a massive proliferation of these cells, expansion uh, proliferation of these cells, and then they quickly contract. And eventually they, uh, are depleted. I'll show you the evidence of that. Um, but later on, when you transplant these recipients with a graft, you can see that they very uh, infrequently traffic to the graft. On the other hand, if you don't tolerate the recipients, of course, these cells will not see their antigen initially prior to transplant, so they wouldn't do anything. But after the transplant, you see uh, a significantly uh, more number of these cells in the graft and they're proliferating as well. So we think that it, eventually these cells are deleted. And the reason that we think so is because in stably tolerized recipients, we can come in and, and use really activated cells. In this case, recipient dendritic cells that are pulsed with donor lysate and then subsequently activated with LPS, we can use such a strong um, recall signal and introduce this type of cells into stably tolerized recipients. And we don't see any effect whatsoever on the stable tolerant uh, graph function. So this suggests to us that these, these, this particular set of, uh, of donor specific T cells are eventually deleted by this um, treatment method. Now there's another subset of donor specific T cells that we think are energized. And again, here the details are not so important. These are called 2C, uh, sorry, 4C uh, donor specific T cells that we again can adoptively transfer into the recipient prior to uh, any manipulation. So if you transfer the 4C cells into just a plain naive uh, mouse, they won't see donor antigen, so they don't do anything. So that's the CSFE peak here without any uh, uh, division or proliferation. And of course, if you challenge these recipients with plain donor cells, in this case, donor splenocytes without ECDI treatment, then you see these cells undergo massive proliferation because they're seeing their antigen. However, if you treat the donor cells, in this case with ECDI SP, they go through a few rounds of proliferation um, 
definitely not quiescent, but most definitely not as rigorous as if you uh, treat the recipients with uh, plain splenocytes without ECDI treatment. But what's more interesting is this. If you then take these cells, so the gray shaded uh, histogram and the black line, and then take them in vitro for re-stimulation, what you can see is that if they've never seen any alloantigen before, now you re-stimulate them with alloantigen, they, they undergo you know, uh, extremely robust proliferation like a naive cell would do. However, if these are cells from ECDI treated recipient and you take them into an in vitro re-stimulation scenario and re-stimulate them again, they do nothing. And they essentially remain how they were when they were in vivo. So this suggests to us that these cells are somewhat energized because uh, they can no longer be re recalled by the same uh, donor stimulation as the ECDISP. And we know that these cells are energized because uh, a feature of energized cell is that they can be reactivated again uh, if, the, if the stimulation is strong, sufficiently strong. And that's indeed the case because here in stably tolerized recipients, if we take donor dendritic cells, in this case, BALP-C dendritic cells and activate them with LPS and introduce it in these cells into uh, the stably tolerized recipients, we see a pretty um, timely rejection of all the grafts suggesting that these cells can indeed be recalled uh, even though they were initially energized by our treatment strategy with ECDI SP. So eventually we did uh, more experiments to kind of help us piece together how ECDI SP really uh, is uh, uh, engaging multiple regulatory pathways to eventually lead to tolerance. So the, the piece together kind of a schematic diagram is depicted for you here. So we have ECDI, uh, donor splenocytes that appear to engage uh, recipient phagocytes through these set of uh, um, receptor tyrosine kinase receptors, specifically MER, and through downregulating interferon alpha, induce a, uh, an expansion of myeloid derived suppressor cells, which then leads to expansion of regulatory T cells. And these cells are both important for uh, tolerance induction, but also in parallel. Uh, depending on whether the ECDI uh, donor SPs engage recipient dendritic cells, which we then worked out uh, through, uh, through upregulation of the negative co-stimulation molecules, PDL1 and PDL2, cause T cells, a subset of donor specific T cells, in this case, indirect T cells, to be depleted. However, they themselves, while they were alive in the recipient for that short period of time, they can also directly stimulate T cells uh, with direct donor specificity, such, such as uh, in a signal one without signal two scenario, cause energy of these cells, which I've shown you data that can be recalled eventually if the stimulation is strong enough. And of course, the MDSCs can also um, uh, utilize a number of soluble factors to suppress uh, T cells of both indirect and direct specificity. So it appears that there is a collective uh, multiple mechanisms that are eventually leading to the tolerance uh, that's established in the recipient. So that's great. So those are all studies in mice. And we have recently taken this to uh, uh, the, uh, the higher animal order level in non-human primates. And these are all bred monkeys. Uh, and we did, uh, monkey to monkey islet cell transplantation. And these monkeys all received a very transient immunosuppressive regimen. Uh, uh, everything, uh, all immunosuppression was discontinued on day 21. And, but what you can see here is that these, this, this two groups, one group received a donor ECDI SP and the other group did not receive donor ECDI SP and the graft survival clearly uh, separated uh, very nicely, again, suggesting that there is a tolerance efficacy of uh, the, uh, these two infusions of donor ECDI-SP.
now we're working with local uh, expertise in non-human primates of bringing this protocol to monkey to monkey kidney transplantation and uh, hopefully if, if very shortly we will be able to uh, write a phase one clinical trial to study this in um, human transplant recipients and in the monkeys just as in the mice we again saw multiple parallel uh, regulatory mecha mechanisms in operation uh, to maintain the tolerance that we, we saw. So what I'm showing you here are uh, adaptive T regulatory T cells, such as TR1 cells, natural su uh, suppressor CD8 cells, and, and this enhancement of regulatory cells seems to um, uh, persist through, through post-transplant three months, six months, and 12 months. And also we saw a, a population of regulatory B cells. And as in our my studies, we saw a population of MDSCs. So again, uh, supporting the concept that it's not just one mechanism, it's probably multiple mechanisms that are in operation by uh, the recipient's treatment with this donor ECDI SP. So this is great. So we spent uh, probably about a decade in, in, in professing this, uh, this uh, tolerance strategy and also to bring it from small animals to large animals. Uh, but it's only when we got there, we realized that in fact, tolerance, achieving tolerance is only just step one because there are in fact many uh, potential threats that can disrupt the tolerance that you so diligently uh, try to establish. So much like this ancient Chinese wisdom that I want to show a picture of, we uh, uh, really spent a lot of time trying to climb to the top of the mountain only to realize that there are much higher peaks out there that we didn't even know existed. And so the next part of the talk that I'm going to uh, really focus on one of such threats that are uh, that that is quite clinically relevant. And what I want to talk about is uh, how cytomegalovirus uh, is a potential threat to the transplantation tolerance. Why are we interested in cytomegalovirus? In the US, the prevalence of CMV, depending on the geographic location, but is uh, on average about 60% in individuals older than 60 years of age. And aging with accumulative probabilities of CMV exposure increases the CMV seropositivity such that in uh, individuals older than 80 years of age, the prevalence of CMV is greater than 90%. So it's actually quite prevalent um, in, uh, in the general population and the general population also represents our, kid, uh, our transplant recipients. So it's highly prevalent both in the donors and in the recipients in our transplant population. Now, this viral infection, like all other, most of all other viral infections, is a lifelong infection because it's capable of establishing latency and it has a striking effect on the immune phenotypes in humans. And this is a, a paper that I really like uh, to quote. Uh, it's, it was published in 2015 in Cell, where they studied uh, essentially monozygotic, um, monozygotic twins, so identical twins. But because of the exposure to the environment, eventually became uh, discordant in their CMV positivity. So they're genetically identical, but uh, one of them is uh, CMV positive and the other is CMV seronegative. And what they were able to show is that they had many, I think something like close to 30 pairs of such monozygotic CMV seropositivity discordant uh, twin pairs. And they were able to compare uh, the immune signature and over 50% of the signatures that the, they interrogated were different between these monozygotic twins, but uh, are, did, uh, were discordant in CMV seropositivity. So CMV clearly has an, an important um, imprint on the immune signature of an individual. So we became interested in whether or not the CMV infection can affect our transplantation tolerance. So what I'm showing you here is a timeline of how we study this. So 
like I mentioned before, time zero, day zero is always the day of transplant. That's shown here in yellow. And the two doses of ECDI uh, splenocytes that we use to induce tolerance is shown here in green. That's day minus seven and day plus one. But we, along the timeline of the recipient, we could uh, introduce CMV infection at various time points. So the first time points uh, that we looked at was day, was day zero, and that is the day of transplant. So the red bars uh, uh, are indicating the time of CMV infection. So if we introduce CMV at day zero, uh, and still do the same uh, ECDI SP infusion on day minus eight, day plus one, and transplant on day zero, what would happen? So what happens is here. So if we introduce uh, CMV infection on the day of transplant, essentially we obliterate tolerance pretty effectively. And so we use a, sorry, I, I should mention this, we use a CMV that, uh, that is uh, a strain that's called Delta M157. And the detail is not important, but suffice it to say that this is a virus that uh, people commonly use to study in the B6 mice because of increased virulence um, of this virus strain in the B6 mice. So what you could see here is that with the CMB infection, we essentially can pretty effectively obliterate uh, the tolerance efficacy of ECDISP. Why is that? Now, this is where I want to um, uh, also remind you of the interferon alpha data that I presented earlier. So this virus actually caused a pretty uh, strong, although transient elevation of antiviral interferon alpha in the serum, which we could see here. And indeed, if we treat the recipient with anti-interferon uh, receptor one, again, blocking the interferon alpha and, and its receptor signaling, we could restore to some degree or pre preserve the tolerance efficacy in the setting of CMV infection. So it appears that at least partially CMV mediates uh, tolerance impairment by elaborating interferon alpha. So what does interferon alpha uh, do? So the, the, the first cell populations that we paid attention to again was these MDSCs that I had mentioned before. So there are two different populations, as you recall, the GR1 high and the Li6C high. So the GR1 high cells appear to be um, suppressed in the presence of CMV infection. And this is um, uh, functionally relevant because it appears, again, that we can partially rescue the tolerance efficacy by adoptively transfer these GR1 high cells, even in the setting of CMV infection. So again, that this depression of MDSC, GR1 high MDSC, seems to be partially reversed if we just forcefully increase the number of this cell population. So that's what CMV appears to do for the GR1 high MDSCs. What about the Li6C high MDSCs? So it turns out that CMV infection causes this, uh, this population to develop a pretty interesting phenotype of uh, upregulation of CD11C and at the same time downregulation of CD115. So when we took these cells, these differentiated CD11 high, CD115 negative cells, and compared to the cells uh, without CMV infection, so the CD115 high and CD11C negative cells, what you could see is that they have quite different expressions of uh, inflammatory cytokines, IL-12, and also the co-stimulation molecule CD86 is dramatically elevated once uh, the cells differentiate into that inflammatory phenotype, and they also to some degree upregulate class two. And we subsequently have shown that these cells can, uh, uh, are actually much more effective in cross-presenting alloantigens comparing to their counterparts prior to CMV infection. So it appears that, uh, that to the Lysic C high cells, CMV infection appears to push them towards a more inflammatory phenotype uh, that are much more capable of presenting alloantigen. Uh, 
Now, this, these effects on Li6C high and GR1 high cells appears to actually affect on the progenitor cells before they differentiate into Li6C high or GR1 high MDSCs. And so what I'm showing you here is, um, is an in vivo study where we looked at a transcription factor called ARF8, which, whose expression is known to inhibit uh, the development of GR1 high MDSCs and also activate the uh, Li6C high cells to di di uh, differentiate into inflammatory monocytes. So what you can see here is that CMV infection, shown here by this blue dotted line, uh, really increased IRF8 expression in both HSCs and GMP progenitor cells that are differentiating into uh, these MDSCs. So it appears that the effect is uh, through bone marrow progenitor cells um, by the acute CMV infection. So here we uh, basically uh, came to this, you know, relatively small uh, summary of how we think MCMV infection through elaboration of interferon alpha actually uh, inhibits the differentiation of GR1 high uh, MDSCs, but at the same time induce the Li6C high uh, cells to differentiate into these inflammatory monocytes that elaborate IL-12, uh, CD11C, and co-stimulation molecules in class two, which eventually leads to uh, activation of donor-specific T cells and also downregulation of regulatory T cells, which I didn't show you, um, but is also uh, true in our studies and eventually leads to the abrogation of tolerance induction. So that is if we introduce the CMV infection at day zero. What happens if we introduce CMV infections slightly later on? So at day 14, at day 95, and these are the time points, uh, as I have shown you before, if we treat the recipients with ECDISP, we essentially can affect indefinite graft survival without immunosuppression for a long period of time. So during these periods, uh, periods of stable graft function at day 14 or day 95, if we introduce CMV, what happens? So this is what happened. So even though uh, day 14 and day 95 uh, infections of, of CMV are not as, as detrimental as day zero, as you could see here, because day zero um, uh, affected a, a, a much higher uh, percentage of, of recipients that are not able to be tolerized. But yet at the same time, day 14 in, in introduction or day 19 introduction of the CMV virus uh, reliably within 15 to 20 days of the infection, you begin to see uh, rejection of these allografts. So, of these allografts. So, so therefore, even if you can uh, uh, delay the infection to the stage of uh, sort of a tolerance maintenance stage, uh, the infection per se is still quite detrimental. Why is that? We so. The first thing we, we asked was, okay, so you reject the graft, and can you then come back and retransplant the recipients uh, with the grafts of the same donor? Are they able to uh, now revert back to to a tolerant state because now your infection has been cleared? Now, it's actually not so, because in these recipients uh, who have rejected their first graft because of uh, CMV infection, when we introduced them with a second graft, they actually had an accelerated uh, rejection such that all grafts were rejected by day five. So a very fast acceleration of rejection. And this is in stark contrast to rejection in a naive uh, recipient that's never seen the graft or CMV before, uh, which uh, 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 normally rejects the graft somewhere between, like I said before, 15 to 20, 25 days. And of course, if you transplant um, a tolerant recipient, a stably tolerant recipient with a second graft, then you can just have the graft last forever. So it seems that 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 the CMV breaking tolerance um, is not only uh, irreversible, but it's actually quite detrimental. And this accelerated rejection is not uh, affected by <clears throat> is is not. Uh, the consequence of humoral sensitization because we actually checked anti-donor antibodies in these sub 
a class of IgGs, and we don't see any upregulation of anti-donor antibodies. So it's a cellular sensitization. So what we saw here, uh, what I'm showing you here, is that at the time of rejection, we actually see a massive increase of uh, intragraft T cells, this case CD4 T cells. But what's really interesting is that uh, these CD4 T cells in a tolerant recipient prior to them CMC uh, and B infection contains this FR4 positive, CD74 positive, double positive cells. These are markers for cell energy. So T cells are energic around the graph that you could, uh, you could uh, retrieve from a tolerant recipient. However, when you treat the recipient with MCMV, it appears that you lose this population of energic cells and they sort of become this FR4 CD74 uh, double negative uh, cell populations. So we have reasons to believe that in the process of them uh, turning from an energic cell into a, a double negative cells, they actually acquire uh, effector cell function. And this is the reason why. So the FR4 positive cells actually can be really effectively depleted by anti-FR4 antibody. So we were able to uh, deplete this energic cell population with this uh, treatment of anti-FR4 antibody. And when you do that and then come back in and reintroduce the MCMV infection, suddenly you're no longer able to break tolerance. So this suggests to us that these cells are indeed um, uh, morphing from an energic phenotype into more of a detrimental anti-donor effector phenotype. And such that if you eliminate them, that you won't have the substrate to become uh, effector uh, anti-donor effector T cells in the presence of CMV, therefore your tolerance is maintained. So that's uh, the story of uh, CMV infection in the acute setting. But like I told you before, CMV infection can also fairly uh, uh, easily establish latency. And that's probably by and large, most of our uh, patient population uh, uh, really are, they're, they're latently infected with CMV. So do latent infection of CMV also affect tolerance? Now, how do we do that? We can introduce CMV as an acute infection into a recipient, and they will go through this uh, uh, phase of viremia, and eventually they'll clear the virus and establish latency. So we do that three months before we even use any of these recipients for transplant. So that's day minus 90. And then three months later, we do the same things of ECDISP and transplant them and ask what happens. So what you can see here is that even, even if in uh, uh, three months prior to uh, uh, being uh, induced for tolerance, the, the mere fact that they, are, they have been in, uh, infected with CMV before actually impairs our tolerance efficacy as well. So, so this is, and we don't quite understand the mechanisms there yet, and we're currently looking into it, uh, but suffice it to say that along this entire timeline of uh, the recipient's lifespan, you could introduce CMV any time uh, 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 along the way that, it, that the effect of CMV infection is detrimental to tolerance. A very unique situation of CMV infection in humans is what we call um, donor positive recipient negative combination. And by that, I mean, you can, you can imagine where you have a donor who's been previously exposed to CMV, but you have a recipient who's never seen CMV before. And so that combination, say a kidney from a donor uh, that's seropositive for CMV into a recipient that's seropositive negative. And this scenario is called D plus R negative combination, which is a really high risk for CMV reactivation in the post-transplant population. And in fact, we can model this scenario in mice by introducing a latent infection into our donor. So in this case, bulb C, we can uh, infect the bulb C donor with CMV and three months later, take its kidney and transplant it into a completely naive B6 mouse in this, uh, in this case, um, a recipient negative. So that's, that's, a, that's a, a, a perfect modeling of the D plus R minus scenario. And we can ask what happens to these virus if we 
we have, uh, if we don't treat the recipients, just let them reject, or if we treat them with standard immunosuppression, just like we would do in a, a patient population, or what if we introduce uh, donor-specific tolerance with this ECDISP. So I'll go very quickly through the result here. We used a tetramer to trace the anti-CNB-specific uh, uh, T cells that are of recipient origin, because this is a recipient class 1 H2KB. So these are uh, uh, CD8 T cells that can only be of B6 origin that are not you know, trafficking leukocytes from the C. So what you see here is that in all three groups, untreated or immune suppressed or tolerant with the ECDI-SP treatment, you can actually see that the, this population, tetramer positive population are readily detectable, which suggests that within the kidney, the D plus kidney itself, uh, you have viral uh, reactivation pretty readily in all three conditions. But what's interesting is that it's only in the immune suppressed condition that these cells cannot elaborate interferon gamma. So these T cells, CD8 T cells, don't have cytotoxicity uh, uh, molecule in, uh, in the setting of immunosuppression. So, so the, the immunosuppression effectively, effectively led to a functional impairment of these donor, uh, sorry, uh, CNB specific CD8 T cells, such that in, in, in essence, uh, it's only in the immunosuppression scenario you do see that the CMV virus actually um, is become measurable. Whereas in the other two scenarios, you, even if you, there are reactivation, uh, you see pretty nice control of the viral load. And so this is at day eight, day 28, day 60 of the kidney allograft. But not only locally, uh, in the immunosuppressed uh, hosts, these virus can also now disseminate from the kidney, which is the source, to a distant organ, uh, in this case, salivary gland, which you can see here. Again, in the untreated or in the tolerized recipients, you actually are able to completely control local measurable virus and you control distant dissemination. So this is a little bit of a tangent, but uh, eventually what I want to sort of uh, 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 bring to your attention is that this nice scheme of tolerance that we spend a lot of time understanding is actually pretty uh, metastable and it can be easily disrupted by these viruses, which are which is actually rather common in our transplant recipients and appears to do so through its effect uh, through its effect on uh, the myeloid cells uh, to the MDSC differentiation pathway possibly mediated by interferon alpha. So in the last two slides, I just want to quickly go through some of our most recent data to suggest that these myeloid cells are actually a powerhouse of tolerance induction. And so what I'm showing you here, this is completely through a different study where we did single cell sequencing of uh, the myeloid cells, the macrophage populations, under tolerance condition versus uh, rejection condition. So what you can see here is that there are a number of genes that are significantly upregulated by the tolerance um, strategy in these macrophages and monocyte populations. And if you look closely to these number of genes, you realize that there are quite a lot of these genes are actually involved in ribosomal biogenesis. Um, uh, that seems to be upregulated by tolerance uh, treatment of these uh, mice. And what's more interesting is that it appears that CMV does exactly the opposite thing to these uh, ribosomal biogenic uh, proteins in comparison to ECDISP. So we think that this may be also um, a, 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 an important aspect of how MCMV antagonizes antagonizes the tolerance signature through its effect on the translational um, uh, apparatus in myeloid cells. So to conclude, I hope I've shown you that different strategies can now be used to establish transplantation tolerance, but our strategy of using peritransplant infusion of donor apoptotic cells is quite safe. It's donor specific and it's been proven to be efficacious in small, large animal models of transplantation and hopefully will eventually lead to clinical translation 
uh, within the near future. And I uh, hopefully have also shown you that there are multiple parallel mechanisms that are implicated in mediating the tolerance that's induced by donor ECDISP. And these include MDSCs, Tregs, as well as energy and deletion of donor specific T cells. Now, again, this is sort of teleologically has to be true naturally. Why should only one mechanism be involved and the other me mechanisms uh, are, are, are un uh, unimplicated. So this sort of says, yeah, um, multiple things are involved and it's probably not going to be useful if you just target one mechanism. So I've also shown you that CMV infection, be it acute or latent, can impair tolerance induction as well as tolerance maintenance. And this impairment is at least partially mediated by its effect on myeloid cell uh, differentiation and function. So our future studies uh, we'll partially be focusing on therapeutic strategies that, uh, that can be used to target myeloid cells to restore and stabilize tolerance in the setting of uh, CMV infection. So with that, I would like to thank everybody who uh, worked on the data that I uh, presented today from my lab, as well as my collaborators initially from Northwestern University and more recently from uh, Duke University. And I will stop here for questions. Thank you very much, Dr. Law. Uh, that was a wonderful talk. Um, that's a lot of uh, um, advances that um, I'm, I'm sure um, it's all coming out of you. Um, it's all came out of your lab and then really a leading force of the uh, uh, trans transplantation tolerance field. Uh, so I have a few questions here. Um, the first um, question, uh, um, I would like to remind everyone that um, please um, type your question in Q&A. I, I already have a few over here and I'm gonna start uh, and we have a few more minutes if you have more questions along the way. So the first one is that uh, what other risks other than CMV exist? Any other viruses or infections that would have the similar effects as the CMV? Yeah. I, I, I'm not a virologist, I have to say, but the, the, so I don't know uh, other uh, uh, viruses that will have exact same effect, but I know that in our post-transplant cohort, two other viruses that are frequently uh, problematic for graft function, uh, one is EBV, which is also a herpes virus, uh, like CMV, but EBV uh, tends to infect B cells and transform B cells and cause what we, uh, we would call post-transplant lymphoproliferative disease, PTLD. So that's one uh, virus, but, but because its tropism is different from CMV, uh, even though it's also a latent virus, whether or not it will have the same effect as CMV, I don't know. The other virus is a polyoma virus that's called BK virus. And the BK virus, the trophism is again, very different from uh, EBVs or CMV. BK virus tend to be uh, latent in the uroepithelial cells. So it affects kidney function uh, in kidney transplant recipient more than any other organs. Now that's also a virus uh, that uh, can be reactivated that we see uh, in our post-transplant recipients. It's probably particularly relevant to a kidney transplant recipient because that's where this virus can be reactivated. But again, how does it affect um, tolerance? Does it uh, affect tolerance like CMV does? I don't know. Um, but given that the trophism is again quite different from CMV, my guess is that it wouldn't be the same. But it, because it, it's in the kidney, it may have a specific implication to tolerance to the kidney allograft. Thank you. Um, so the second question is that, um, so if there's a, uh, just assuming that the recipient has autoimmune disease, which also uh, have the implication that there will be high interferon alpha for these patients. Um, so um, what will happen? Yeah. So I think through multiple uh, uh, data sets, uh, initially we, we actually looked at MER-TK uh, deficiency that we saw the interferon alpha signature. And then we, in the CMV, we also saw the interferon alpha signature. So I think interferon alpha is probably, uh, it's safe to say that it's detrimental to tolerance induction. And I think that your point is very, very good. In autoimmune host, you may at baseline have a higher level 
of uh, interferon alpha and how would you deal with that? I think that this is uh, you know, clearly the difference between uh, an outbred uh, natural human population uh, recipient population compared to you know, laboratory SPF uh, 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 inbred mice. And so I think that whether or not this type of tolerance will be effective in all kinds of recipients, be it uh, autoimmunity or sensitized or have different viral infection history in the past will have to be worked out. And so, uh, so you know, a, a, a slides that I normally like to show is that it's probably not one size fits all. And uh, you see that, that, that there are uh, bone marrow chimera mechanisms that can be utilized for tolerance induction. And then there is this donor apoptotic cells that can be used for um, for uh, tolerance induction. There are also other mechanisms, well, past uh, strategies people use regulatory T cells to induce uh, tolerance or regulatory macrophages. So you can begin to see that you actually have um, a choice of uh, in your armamentarium of what you can use to induce tolerance. And these different tolerance strategies may be effective for different uh, patient populations. So I would say in a high interferon alpha situation, uh, this ECDISP is probably not going to be that effective. But there may be ways that you can deal with that, for instance, blocking the interferon alpha and interferon alpha receptor pathway. Now, in a lot of the autoimmune recipients, we also don't transplant patients at the peak of their autoimmunity because, uh, uh, because disease can also recur in the transplant uh, uh, allograft. Uh, so we, in general, wait until their disease is much better controlled before we use, before we even contemplate transplanting them. So that's also a consideration as well. Um, due to the time constraint, I'm just going to ask one more question. Um, so, uh, so what's the role of gut microbiota? Um, there's our uh, news and literature on uh, organ transplantation and in relevance to gut microbiota. And how would that affect the tolerance that you're talking about here? Yeah, so that's a really good question that I have no answer to, because so far we have only studied uh, this uh, these in SPF uh, um, re recipients. But you you're absolutely right that they're they're even without any tolerance, any immunosuppression, just by changing the microbiota of the recipient, you would affect different. Uh, rejection kinetics. So clearly, the immune response to the microbiota uh, can be um, implicated in how you would respond to an allo antigen. But I know I'm hand waving here a little bit because I absolutely have no data of of, of knowing uh, how this would affect um, affect tolerance efficacy. But I would I would imagine that. Uh, depending on what microbiota are, are implicated or are in a particular host, this will again introduce variabilities of uh, tolerance efficacy. Well, thank you very much. Thanks again. And um, we can't clap because this is a Zoom, but uh, thank you very much for your wonderful presentation. And I also thank the audience for coming. Thank you. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm.